Welcome to episode 22 of How About Them Huskies. I'm Connor. I'm joined with Matt, Andrew, and Matt. And today we're going to talk about a tough UConn loss. We've talked about a couple of tough losses recently. This one to number 13, Xavier, 82-79 to at Gamble Pavilion. UConn's 17-game win streak at Gamble is snapped. It was really just a tough game. It was actually, there were some highs and lows. The first half, only scoring 24 points was a low. But outscoring them by 12 in the second half and dropping 55 is definitely a positive. We'll get into all the stats in a little bit. But I want to hear from you guys before we really begin. What are your thoughts on the game as a whole? Well, I mean, that hole that we dug ourselves into in the first half was just too large to come out of in the end. I believe we were down by 15 or 16 at the half, and we did get it down to one. We were never leading in that game. Xavier had the lead for all uh, 40 minutes of that game and then even just like the start of the game having being down nine nothing and then Andre not finding his uh his feel for shooting the ball I mean got to give credit to Sean Miller there for leaving him open but he just couldn't find his feel Xavier had the momentum early and it just went kind of downhill from there but I do want to give the guys credit for not going and just running and hiding and taking a 30 or a 35 piece you know they battled back they got it down to one but they were just never able to get over that hump of even tying it or winning by one like that's that's one of the hardest things to do in college basketball is like you can come back from when you can come back from 90 but getting over that and taking that lead by one is the single hardest thing to do when you're down by over 15 points and we just couldn't get over that hump but you know positive out of that second half because we looked like old December beating up on, on Alabama kind of UConn you know but that first 20 minutes was not good at all and that's what really lost us the game yeah and what Andrew just said about the psychological aspect of taking the lead back I was about to say the same thing that's absolutely true but besides that I just want to say how proud of this group I am and how much better things look after we still are losing games but after the tough losses we had um they showed that it can be repaired when they really lock in and they were very locked in in the second half. Obviously they never got over that hump, but Xavier's probably the best team in our conference there. Um, could be a final four team. They're a very, very good team. And when we really put it together, we were dominant at some points in the second half. And obviously we never took the lead back, but like you said, um, we won the second half by 12 points. And if it wasn't for Sule boom going absolutely unconscious on us, who's old enough to be my father, I'll add. I'll just add that. He's a very old player. If it wasn't for him going absolutely unconscious at the beginning of the second half, um, things could have looked a lot different uh, in the win, win column. Yeah, and we, we had a lot of underwhelming performances, I would say, too. Um, I'm glad we stuck around. Uh, Sonoga only had 11. Klingon had two. We only had six total bench points. So the fact that we pulled it back that close uh, towards the end of the second half uh, shows a lot about the character of the team and about our best players, especially Jordan Hawkins, hell of a game he had. But, uh, yeah, I'm just very proud that, you know, they stuck around and were able to bring it back with some underwhelming performances from top guys. That's a point I wanted to make about uh, Hawkins is you can quote me for this. You can screen record it and post it and call me an idiot if it doesn't happen. But Jordan Hawkins is going to be a lottery pick. He's starting to look more like James Book Knight attacking the rack. You know, finishing is something that he's going to develop as he gets older. You know, if he has to develop that in the G League or something, kind of how Book Knight did, you know, so be it. But I think he's gotten himself to be a lottery pick, not just because of the points, but I'm going to keep harping on this point. His ability to create his own shot is unmatched of many, many guards that I've watched. I mean, like Sule Boom killed us from three, but he needed to be open. You know, he can't make a move to get open. Hawkins can make one jab step move and get open. I mean, on a defender who's four or five inches taller than him. So I think he's really starting to become our biggest bright spot. You know, Sonogo, he got killed down there by Fremantle and Nunji. But, you know, that, that stuff's going to happen. He had a tough game uh, a little while back. But, you know, Hawkins is starting to be, uh, I think, our brightest spot here as we move through this season. Yeah, one last thing about Jordan Hawkins and his NBA future. Um, guys who are about 6'5 plus and can just run around, run off screens in the half court all possession, invaluable in today's NBA. That's exactly what GMs are looking for to surround their star players with and even guys who could become star players. So the way he just runs off screens, off ball screens, um, 
kind of reminds me of Jordan Poole the way um, he plays a two-man game. He'll dump the ball off to the center, um, have another guy set him a screen, try to get open again. So he's definitely um, got the type of game that NBA scouts are looking for in the modern NBA. And I wouldn't be surprised if he was a lottery pick either, but he's got a bright future. Yeah, and with Hawkins, we all know the picture going around social media when Ray Allen visited the practice. There's a picture of the two talking to each other. Since that happened, he's averaging 23 points per game in four games, which it's a small sample size, but it's really an improvement. I'm not saying he was bad before, but he's been just on fire. And I want to talk about a couple other players here. We'll, we'll get to everyone, but some that stick out. The beginning of the game, Andrew mentioned it was a rough. We dug, us, dug ourselves into a hole. Andre Jackson, 0 for 7 in the first four minutes. That just can't happen. I understand they're giving him the looks. I mean, he took 12 threes against Xavier last game, but you can't do that. I mean, it, I'm not saying that lost us the game. We had plenty of other things that didn't go well and other chances to win, but starting the game like that was brutal. Yeah, and when you start games like that, it's very difficult to dig yourself out of that hole. Uh, Jackson, the rest of the game, he shot 3 of 12. So, um, I mean, that that beginning of the game really killed him, really crushed him. Uh, we didn't see much of him the rest of the game, and he didn't do much outside. There were only two rebounds, two assists. So, very quiet night for him. But, I mean, uh, big ups to the guys for bringing him back. Well, so maybe a little award here for Andre. We talked about he struggled on offense, but he, his defense is there. And just today, the Naismith Defensive Player of the Year watch list was released to top 15 in the country, and he is on there. He's one of two Big East players. Colt Brenner with Creighton is there as well. That's cool to see he's getting recognized for his defense, even if the offense isn't 100% at all times. And also, you mentioned we mentioned Sonogo struggled a little bit. I feel like he did what he could. 11 points, 9 rebounds when he was getting doubled on the catch every single time. I mean... That was obviously Xavier's game plan, double Sonogo and leave a guy like Jackson open on the wing, and it works for the most part. But I'm not really too upset with the Damas performance. He had a three-pointer, four assists, which I'm not sure if that's his career high. It probably is. I mean, he's not known as a playmaker. But, yeah, I'm not too disappointed in the Damas performance. Yeah, and you just brought it up at the assists, and that's what I wanted to say about Sonogo was his decision-making off double teams looked much improved last night. And um, he really he really put together some very, very positive plays in the second half, especially in a game when Klingon wasn't doing so well. And he was really a big part of that comeback. Yeah, I'll go down the list here. Alex Caravan, he only he only scored five points, one of three from three. But he wasn't – I'm not saying he's usually terrible on defense. We always kind of knock him on this podcast. He's not the greatest defender. But he didn't really stick out as bad. He kind of held his own against Fremantle. Fremantle just nine points. But, I mean, Caravan, he was kind of just there. I mean, like I said, not a stellar performance, but definitely not a bad one. There were some people that weren't so good, but definitely a solid performance against a pretty tough big man in Fremantle. Yeah, and I've noticed steady improvement uh, just from the majority of the guys. Uh, defensively, effort-wise, um, even though we've gone in a bit of a cold spell, I've noticed like a lot of a lot of positives. Newton, one of them, very aggressive on the defensive end, very aggressive rebounder, along with Caravan now getting in there on defense and rebound, and it looks great. Yeah, you're leading me into my next player here, Newton. You called him aggressive. I have a pretty, pretty eye-opening stat when I looked it up. Aggressive Newton is amazing, Newton. And he's averaging 17 points per game when he takes 10 or more shots. And he's only averaging 7.6 when he takes fewer than 10. So even if he's not hitting, if he's just getting those shots up, there he's getting his points somehow, whether that's at the free throw line. Like he went 9 for 11 last night. I mean, 23 points, arguably, maybe the triple-double or the Oregon game. But this is right up there with his best games since he's came to UConn. I'm really impressed with him. He had the size advantage over Sule Boom, and he took advantage of it. I mean, speaking of free throws, though, goodness gracious, we got to work on those. I mean, Donovan, it happened in, I think, the Butler game, too. I mean, Donovan, if he's going to go for all those alley-oops, and obviously teams are going to foul him because you really can't have alley-oops like that happen to get the t- um the fans hyped up and stuff, you got to make those free throws. So you can't go for an alley-oop and then draw a foul and then miss both. I mean, I think at one point we missed five in a row, I mean, that's five extra free points that could have won us that game. But free free throws just have to be worked on. I mean, we should miss maybe three max in a game. I mean, these guys are all full scholarship athletes at one of the, I mean, a top 20 team 
in the country. They all obviously earn their scholarships. We got to hit the free shots, especially at home when you have the crowd on your side. You just can't miss free throws like that, especially five in a row. Yeah, I mean, it's huge to see we had some misses, but Newton, like I mentioned, I'll take nine for 11 any night. I mean, it's solid. Hawkins, perfect, seven for seven. I mean, the guys that are supposed to be hitting him are hitting him. It's the big men like Klingon, and I guess Caravan, he's supposed to hit his free throw. He went 0 for 1, but we'll look past that. But, yeah, free throws, I mean, you missed six, lost by three. I mean, that could be a big difference in the game. And I'll talk about the bench real quick. There wasn't too much from the bench. I mean, Nahima Lean, he checked in after Jackson had his whole fiasco in the first couple of minutes. He hit a three right away. I was thinking, oh, maybe Aline's back. He didn't really do anything after that. But it's good to see he saw one go in. Joey Calcaterra, he didn't have it. He hasn't had it very often recently. But there's one play. It's been a couple of times it's happened with him where there's a fast break, and it's usually Andre kicking it out to a wide-open Joey on the wing. And if he hits the shot, the building's going to explode, and he just misses it. I'm pretty sure he missed it, like, completely last night in that situation, like, missed the rim totally. So that's not good to see. Klingon, we touched upon, he he was really a non-factor, but there's been, we're, we're not too, I'm saying we're not too surprised, but there's been games where Sonogos dominated those minutes, so not really much Klingon going on there. And Hassan Diara, he's a guy, he didn't really do much either. It's almost like you didn't even notice he played, which that's not really a bad thing, not necessarily, but he's not known for his scoring. He's not known to put up even like five, six points. He's in there for his defense. His defense was solid, but he didn't have the stats, like he didn't have any steals. He had a block, but... Hassan, he's he's in there just to just to disrupt things. His stuff's not going to show up in the stat sheet, so I'm not too disappointed he didn't have that great of a game. So I know he had an impact in other places. Yeah, with that three, um, with Joey you mentioned, I've just noticed that since that Georgetown game where he hit all those, uh, really crazy shots and started to play like he was Steph Curry, he hasn't been setting his feet at all. He's always falling sideways or falling back or catching it and shooting it without setting his feet. Like, I mean, you watch the Butler game. He set his feet for maybe like two or three seconds and he drilled the three. I mean, yeah, he's a good shooter. He's got a great form. He's got a great eye for the basket. But I mean, you, ha- I mean, he, if he's that wide open, he's got to set his feet. He's just rushing it, rushing his shots. And I think that he might be on his last string here because if we really need him to hit shots at big times, and he's not coming through right now, I think we might start to see a minutes decrease from him. Yeah, one thing about Joey is he's such an X factor because when we were on that huge win streak, he was playing spectacularly almost every night. I think he was averaging north of 50% from three over that stretch. And after the Georgetown game, when we started losing more games than we were winning, um, you know, he just wasn't showing up. His stats haven't been there since. His playing hasn't been there since. So he's just such an X factor. If he could really have it going, then it helps us. So hopefully this is just a huge cold streak. But we saw what he could do at the beginning of the year. Yeah, Joe, he was a part of a crucial sequence at the end of the game. We'll start with, I don't remember how much time is left, maybe like 30 seconds. We're running our set to try to get Hawkins open for a three to tie it. We don't have it there. So we just kind of go into panic mode and we get Hawkins wide open on the wing. He drills the jumper, but Dan Hurley called a timeout and the jumper didn't count. So that, that just can't happen for Hurley. I mean, that's a complete mismanagement there. And I'll just finish off the sequence to the end here. Uh, They got the timeout off. Obviously they inbounded it. Didn't get a good look. They had a couple of times they could throw it up, but it just ended up with Tristan getting fouled with like two seconds left and down by three. I mean, the game's over at that point. He hit both free throws, but then we fouled right away to get the ball back and it was Hawkins' fifth. So even if, say, Xavier made the two, we don't have, we didn't even get a shot off at the end. It's just mismanagement and it's not the first time. I'm not saying it lost us the game, like I said, a lot of things, but just that can't happen, especially at this level to just call that timeout. I mean, maybe he wasn't looking at the play unfolding. Maybe he saw something else, Hurley, but this can't happen. Let him play on. This is a rarity here, but Connor, I'm actually going to go against you here. That timeout was a perfect call because that possession was terrible. That was destined to be a bad pass thrown into a turnover. And I mean, if you watched it, the defender, if you hear the whistle as a defender, you don't ever go for the ball. So I forget who was guarding him, but I watched it on replay about 18 times. And as soon as that whistle blew, the defender backed off, allowing Hawkins to be that open. I can promise you that if that whistle is not blown, he's not backing off like that. Um, 
And I'm going to give Hurley credit for that timeout because that possession was really, really bad. It wasn't going anywhere. It was going to result in a turnover, in my opinion. But, uh, yeah, a rarity here, but I got to go against you there, Connor. <laughs> I definitely agree with you with your reasoning, except he made the shot. And I'm not saying that – I'm not speaking for everyone here, but there's a lot of people like on UConn Twitter that are pissed off that Hurley did that, even though like you, I didn't look into it as deeply as you did with 18 times or whatever you said. But, yeah, I mean, it just doesn't look good, even even if it wasn't really what it seems. It just doesn't – not a good look, I think. Here, I'll just add my input on this real quick. Uh, we've never been much of a debate podcast, but it's coming up right now. And my opinion on it is if the ball's in your best player's hand and you really need a play to be made, just don't take a timeout. That's just my opinion. I'm going to cut us right even down the middle here because I agree with Andrew. Um, I believe that the possession was entirely broken. What Hurley wanted wasn't happening, but the play, like the, the set wasn't correct. Nothing was going right. And that would have been a bailout shot. If Hawkins missed that shot, everyone would have been, everybody would have been right on Hurley's back calling him an idiot for not calling a timeout in a broken possession. And that serious of a situation in the game, in my opinion, it was a safe bet to take that timeout. Um, that shot you know, Hawkins lucky he made it because, you know, he has the he has the side of Twitter now. But if he doesn't make that shot and we don't call a timeout, then what? Then you're yelling at Hurley because he doesn't call a timeout. I think the takeaway from this is that um, Dan Hurley can't win in the fans eyes no matter what. Yeah. And if Hawkins say he misses it, like you said, and they don't call a timeout, everyone's like, why is he taking a two point shot with 20 seconds left down three? I mean, it's really a lose lose situation there all in all. And I was really, I mean, they picked it up a little bit in the second half, but I was disappointed with the defensive effort from this team, especially a Hurley coach team that emphasizes defense. I mean, it felt like Xavier, they were getting buckets at will. Like Sole, Sule Boom hit his first five threes. I mean, Jones was on fire. Even like Desmond Claude had a wide open dunk that he just, I mean, he's a, He's a talented young player, but that can't happen. Even Nunji, he had a quiet 12 points, but a bunch of his buckets were little wide open floaters. I mean, the defense was not there. I mean, it's a little surprising. I know Xavier is definitely a very talented offensive team. One of the best, if not the best in the conference. I mean, Marquette might have that. They're number one offensively in Ken Palm, actually. So Marquette might have that that, to that for them. But I think really that can't happen on defense for UConn. Yeah, that might have been some of the worst perimeter defense I've seen out of this team. And I mean, what we were doing essentially was trying to trade threes for twos. You know, Xavier was hitting their threes and we were trying to get twos. You're not going to come back that way. I mean, you you have to force people inside. You know, if they get the inside shots, that's fine. But you can't leave people wide open. Like, Sule Boom's killing you from three. You cannot leave him wide open. I mean, the tall guys underneath, too. Uh, Nunji and Fremantle, I mean, they, they were the ones really just scoring at will. I mean, drawing fouls, too. The foul shots were pretty even. I think it was 19 to 18 in favor of Xavier. Um, but still, just the perimeter defense, leaving guys wide open in a game like that. Like, you get the Gamble crowd hyped up, bam, somebody drills a wide open three, and there goes the air right out the top of the arena. So you, you can't play perimeter defense like that. You Like, you have to lock people down. Don't let people cut. But, yeah, that might have been some of the worst perimeter defense I've seen out of this team in a long time. Yeah, and Xavier made a lot of tough shots, and that's kind of what they do, and it's not going to fall every night. But we also gave them way too many easy shots. Xavier's going to make tough shots. They're a very proficient offensive team. But that's why you can't give them easy shots because they're going to make what they make. But, you know, if you're just giving it to them, then you're going to be in some serious trouble. Uh, this group needed to have a stretch like this, in my opinion. It's going a little bit over, you know, what we uh, first thought, but I feel like they need to lose. This team with all these players on it, a lot of, you know, not necessarily egos, but, you know, your Joey Calcaterra's, your Jordan Hawkins, all the guys like that, you know, Hawkins, NBA talent. Calcaterra was the hype train for the first half of the season, first at the whole preseason, essentially. Um they needed to lose. They needed to learn what it's like to lose, especially in games, you know, you have no business losing like St. John's and whatnot. But, you know, if this isn't who we are and that second half of the game is who we are, then we have a great March coming up because if we can put it together like that throughout the rest of the season, you know, we'll look really good going into March. And that's what you need. You need 
momentum going into March because teams that have momentum going into March make deep runs. And if we can build up, if we can get Calcaterra back playing hundred percent, how he was at the start of the season, Hawkins shooting more shots than honestly, I think he should, because when he does put it up, the ball goes in. If we can get a less aggressive Adama, more likely to share the ball, that would be fantastic because he's great with the ball. Now imagine him passing it to Jordan Hawkins. We can get an Andre Jackson who can consistently hit a three. It will look great. You know, Hurley is going to preach that they need to learn and they need to play better because Hurley can't play on the court for 40 minutes. He needs them to step up. And the more they lose, the more they'll learn. So hopefully, you know, that was the end of the losing and the learning. And now we can just put it all to use. Yeah, they definitely want Hawkins to shoot more on that last play where it really just fell apart after the timeout. They were trying to get Hawkins' his open shot, but I'm pretty sure I saw a quote from Sean Miller that they switched up their game plan for that last play. Usually they weren't switching on screens there. They did switch, so Nunji was just blocking Hawkins' view of the ball. He couldn't even get it to him. And we're speaking of, we spoke a lot about Sule Boom. I feel like it'd be a little rude here at How About Them Huskies if we didn't wish him a happy 24th birthday today. So happy birthday, Sule. And another side note, the 23-year-old Luka Doncic, his fourth all-star appearance to, today was announced. So congrats to him there. Uh, you do, do, do with that stat what you will. And we'll move on here, UConn. We're not going to preview the DePaul game tonight, but the next game is on the road at DePaul at Wintrust Arena. And actually, this weekend, DePaul, sellout crowd versus Marquette. First time ever, I believe, I saw DePaul as a sellout crowd. So why not make it two in a row? I mean, UConn's coming to town on next Tuesday, and if you use code HBTH at checkout at SeatGeek for your tickets to the DePaul game, I mean, if you all use it, we'll fill it up, and it's another sellout crowd in Chicago. It'd be awesome. I mean, use code HBTH, get $20 off your first order. I mean, the boys need it. They're in a little bit of a funk. I mean, DePaul, they, they lost to Georgetown, but they beat Xavier, so they're really the definition of a wild card there, so... If you can't make it out of Chicago, we understand, but we got to try to make it a sellout, make it get get the Paul on a sellout streak there. So use code HBTH at checkout for $20 off your first purchase. And I have a couple more points here, then we'll wrap up. I want to talk about something. I want to hear your guys' thoughts. When Zach Fremantle, obviously he picked up a technical with Klingon, which we're not even really getting into that. It just happened. It's no, not really a talking point. But after that was his fourth foul. He picked up his fifth later, and there was like a five to ten minute delay deciding if he really fouled out. That can't happen. And in my mind, I feel like Xavier on the bench there, they knew it was his fifth. They were stalling. I don't maybe that's just our weekly conspiracy here, but I feel like I mean you can't count to five if you're a Xavier. I mean, five fouls you're out. I mean, it should not have taken that long. I mean, that's just my thoughts. I want to see what you guys think. They were a hundred percent stalling. I mean, it should not take five to ten minutes to do that. I mean, there's somebody keeping a book, I believe, at the scores table. Go look at the book, look at uh Fremantle's fouls. If it says five, he's done. We don't need to ask the fans, we don't need to ask the coaches. Go check the hard copy of the book and see if he has the five fouls. I mean, everybody in the arena also knew that, by the way, and it appeared it looks like both coaches were mad at different refs. I mean, if I don't know if you saw the clip on Twitter, but Hurley had some uh, colorful words for Jeff Anderson, understandably so. My goodness, but we won't get into that uh, here. But that w- that's, that is really unacceptable. And for all three refs to not know for sure, I mean, come on now. Like, you, you have to see what Xavier was doing. Completely took the momentum out of us. You know, it's tough to say that that, lost us the game because you can't really blame it on a, a delay because of a foul, but everybody knew he had five. I mean, he was also with a, like a little under six minutes left. I mean, the guy, he was playing dumb all game, stupid fouls. He picked up the technical. I mean, you have to know how many fouls he has, especially, I mean, isn't there an assistant coach that's supposed to keep track of people that are in foul trouble? And if he had three, then he's in trouble. He gets that technical in the personal and three plus two is in fact five for the people that go to Xavier. But that's just that's got to be something that somebody has to be on top of. Either a ref, a coach, a official scorer, somebody's got to be on top of that. But a delay like that that happened in that game just cannot cannot happen again. The great thing about Gable Pavilion is that it tells you in big bold text right up there and all the way over there. And if you just look up, you can look and see how many fouls he has. I don't understand why it was such a problem. Uh, all signs were pointing to five fouls, and there was really no argument for four. I mean, maybe if Sean Miller was that, you know, dumb about it, and he didn't know a technical foul is a foul, maybe I could see it. But 
it, it's basketball, man. You've been a coach for how long and you don't know these things? Yeah, and that was a call I've seen elementary school refs make much more timely and easier. And the officiating all year in the Big East has been spotty at best. And that's not just for us. Uh, it's things that they've called for in favor of us. It's things in other games, and they really need to figure that out. Yeah, we'll switch gears here a little bit. We talked about really every player and their performance. A guy we didn't mention because he didn't check in was Samson Johnson. I know I said he was my player to watch for this one because of his size against the Xavier Biggs, but this was a game we didn't really go to the bench much at all, and I'm not really too surprised in the long run he didn't get in. Obviously, I wouldn't be surprised if he got in either, but he hasn't played too much basketball recently, and this is a huge game. It's a top 15 team in Xavier, probably a top 10 team next week. And it's just not a I – mean, it is a great matchup, but it's also not a great matchup for him at the same time. So I'm not too surprised. I think he will be a factor at least a little bit against DePaul and Georgetown in the coming week, though. Yeah, playing guys who have been hurt for a really long time is the toughest thing to do, especially in a game like this. I think he'll see a lot of action against DePaul personally. But, I mean, in a physical game like that where they have two – like six eleven, seven footers who just drop their shoulder and drive into people's chest. Like I think it was a safe play to not play him because I mean, you know, you gotta take the right risks. Um, and I, I personally think that if we played Samson, then that's he's got a little bit of a target on his back because of how I'm not saying that Xavier is a team notoriously known for purposely hurting players, but you know, you see someone who's been hurt and you know that's definitely that's definitely something that you want to take note of because not to try to hurt them or anything, but you know, they might be as might not be as strong on the uh, defensive end or not as quick as they were. So I think it was a smart choice not to play him just in a physical game like that. But I, I think you'll see plenty of action against DePaul and Georgetown, which are our next two. Yeah, definitely. And we got one last point here I want to talk about, and then we'll wrap up. Xavier, I think one of you guys mentioned it before. They only played seven players to our nine. Obviously, our nine, three of them played less than 10 minutes. But obviously, not saying it's a recipe for success, but Xavier won playing just those seven guys. And I feel like at some point, we've seen it last year. We've mentioned this multiple times. We've trimmed down to like six, almost seven, if you want to count Gaffney's five minutes. But really, I think we're going to see it again this year. We're going to trim the rotation down. We have 10 guys, including Sampson, that can – earned spot in that rotation i personally think it'll be down to eight with the eighth getting minimal five six minutes come march i just want to hear your guys's opinion on that as a whole i feel like i'll add one more thing here you have three guards coming off the bench diara aline calcaterra none of which are really giving you too much production offensively i feel like you don't need all three taking up time you could be giving to newton hawkins or jackson on the perimeter Yeah, my opinion, Diara's got to be a must off the bench just because of his defense. You know, if you're going to take Newton out, you got to put Diara in for him just because of the way he plays defense. But honestly, I would love to see Hawkins consistently play 37 minutes, especially if he's like as hot as he is. And I do think the player, like I said earlier, that would end up losing those minutes is Cal Katera because Aline, for being small, he can guard the three depending on who is playing it. And that's definitely something that if Andre Jackson gets into foul trouble like he tends to do sometimes or needs a breather that he can do, and obviously Killian's going to come off the bench. But I do think the person that will lose that time come March is uh, Calcaterra, which really does stink because I love watching him play, but you really have to take in um, production here as a factor, and he just hasn't produced like he has. I mean, I love to see him get back on track. I do think that the next two games are perfect for him to kind of gain some confidence but if I did have to pick one player who would lose that uh that means he only got six in that game but he would be the guy I feel like who would lose that um that spot in the rotation just because he's not much of a factor on defense and the other guy that might lose it is a starter in caravan so we just we got to think defense first like a quote that I saw I think it was from Borges on Twitter um the defense had to come first because the offense bounces off the defense. And that's just simple basketball terminology. It's something that really every basketball fan knows or should know. Um, and that's really where we got to start. And if we have people that aren't playing defense like they should be, then our offense isn't going to get going at all. 
Yeah, and I remain confused on um, the whole rotation, rotational issue, because after we lost to St. John's, I remember Hurley saying something about, oh, we're going to make uh, rotation adjustments. I haven't seen any of them. I haven't seen anything. All the guys are playing all the same minutes. If anything, you cut minutes, uh, which isn't isn't really what we need at all. Uh, you want to see more of the bench guys, if anything, because these guys are running around for 38 minutes. You know, they get tired. But, you know, I'm I'm still a little confused about what Hurley was talking about. I mean, we've seen more guard play with the mix of Newton and uh, Diara. I remember they were in at the same time a, a, a couple games ago. But, yeah, still very confused about the, the rotations. Yeah, Newton and Diara, they're actually in for around like five, four or five minutes last night together. So that's definitely happened a couple of times. And I feel like you got a guy like I, I singled out the three guards. Andrew mentioned DR should be in there. I agree. He definitely should. It comes down to a lean in Calcaterra. I, I mean, they're both key parts to this team. And I look at, I personally look at for March experience, both obviously are one's a senior, one's a grad student, but the only real postseason experience Joey's got is playing two minutes as a freshman in an NIT loss. And the Himalayan has a 28-point game in the NCAA tournament. So I'm not saying that's a determining factor, but I really think with Aline, he's done it in the big stage before. It happened in a loss to Florida, but he's been on the big stage. Joey really hasn't been there. And Joey, even if he exits the rotation, I'm not saying he will, but even if he does, he still seems like a guy. He may get in once a game if you need a big shot. And if he hits it, he gets more run. If he doesn't, it's just back to the bench like nothing happened. But yeah, and... I really, I'll be honest here. When we brought in Calcaterra, I didn't expect him to play much. Like these six minutes is kind of what I thought we get from him. He exceeded my expectations in the preseason non-conference games. But this is kind of the Joey I thought we'd be getting as he's moving up from the West Coast Conference to the Big East. And yeah, I mean, obviously you want every, it'd be cool if we had a nine-man rotation because I mean, everyone would be playing so well, we couldn't take anyone out. But that's not the case, unfortunately. And I think that'll just about do it here for episode 22, unless you guys have anything else to say here. Um, we're not going to preview the DePaul game today. We're going to do that in a separate episode coming out before the game. But yeah, UConn, another tough loss versus X. And I see, Andrew, you want to jump in before we close? Yeah. Um, in the great words of Big Larry Forearm on Twitter, if you've got the uh, pleasure of reading any of his tweets, we're one and one on the new season. And we're on to the Paul. That's what it comes down to. On to the next one. Never dwell on the past. It's just on to the next one. This team's still good. You know, we're we've six of our last eight, you know, forget that. Throw that out the window. We can easily, not easily, but if we play our way, if we play basketball like we know how to, we can win out the rest of the season and just keep riding with this team and don't give up. Because we've been there with them all season. Just because they're starting to lose a little bit now doesn't mean it's time to give up. This team still got it. Yeah, and I just want to say one last thing, too. Um, What I saw last night was a step in the right direction. What I saw against Butler was a step in the right direction. And they were really down in the trenches like a week, two weeks ago. And I think that they're slowly climbing back up and right before March hits here. And they're um, – what I my New Year's resolution for this team was to be peaking at the right time, and I really think it's still a strong possibility with this UConn squad. Yeah, I mean, look at the schedule. We got nine game, nine regular season games left. Two against DePaul and one versus Georgetown. That's a third year games you should certainly win, but you never know. I obviously we talked about DePaul a few minutes ago with their ups and downs, but the the. The formula is there to potentially win out, but with this team, who knows? They're a complete, complete wild card when it comes to that type of thing. And, yeah, I think now we'll just about do it here. Like I said, tough loss to Xavier, but like Andrew said, move on, one and one on the new season. We got nine games left to prove it, and it starts on Tuesday versus DePaul. So thanks for watching, and stay tuned for a preview of that one.